excited to be here this morning, and I, I'm excited for what God has for us. God's been putting something on me for the last couple of weeks. When Pastor told me about this, of course, I began to pray about what we we're going to speak on, and, and things just started lining up in different ways, and God enlightened me in, in some different ways. And uh, for me personally, and I just thought, why not, why not just unload this this morning? And uh, before I do, I share a little story. There was this guy who... Uh, he had a son, and he just desired to, he really wanted to know what his son was going to do with his life, right? You have kids, you want to know where they're going to go in the future. So he, he set up a little test. In the room, he, uh, on the dresser, he put up a Bible. He says, okay, if that son grabs that Bible, he's going to be a preacher. And then right by the Bible, he puts a silver dollar, and, right, and so he says if he picks up that silver dollar, he's going to be a businessman. And then by the silver dollar, he put a bottle of crown. He says he grabs that. He's going to have problems with alcohol. And then by that, he puts some suggestive magazines. That's what I'll say. Uh, and he says he grabbed that. He's going to be a womanizer. And right beside that, he put a fake money. And he says he grabs that. He's going to be a liar. And so he's, he got in the closet and he just waited for his son to come in the room and pick, see what he's going to choose. And the, room, the son finally came in. He looked at all five options and he grabbed all five options and took off. And the father, he just put his head down and, and just discouraged. He's like, my son's going to be a politician. <laughs> it's terrible. It's terrible. That literally has nothing to do with what I'm going to talk about today. I just thought it was funny. Uh, what, what's cool about this message, I want to try to do something a little bit different and a little less me and more about what we're talking about. And I thought the best way, so we're talk, today we're talking about intentional investment, investing in people. And I thought the best way to start this is not to share my side of things, but uh, Josh got up here earlier and uh, you, got, you know him a little bit from just him being up here, but I want you to hear his story. Because the story has a lot to do with what God can do in somebody's life, but... Um, it has a lot to do with investment, too. So I'm going to give him an opportunity to come share with you guys his story. Y'all give it up for Josh. We're back, baby. What is up, you guys? How are you doing? Um, tell a little bit my, my testimony, my story, real quick, trying to be too long. Joseph still got to come up here and preach a little bit. Uh, for me, growing up wasn't the easiest. Both my parents were uh, addicted to drugs, had alcohol problem. They were both involved in a gang which led to me having a pretty rough home life growing up most of my time. At some point, it got so rough that me and my brothers were taken away by Child Protective Services. We were put in foster care. While we were in foster care, we were sadly abused as well. It was not a good time. So we had to leave foster care and go live with my grandma. She's a great woman. And it started this little cycle of me and my brother staying with our grandma, my parents either going to jail or rehab, getting sober, winning custody back for us, and then falling again, going back with grandma. And, and the cycle kept going and going for several, several years as I was growing up, until I was about in middle school, when I finally got to just stay with our grandma. They stopped giving our parents custody, and we just got to stay with them. Sadly, while I was in middle school, I had two people really close to me commit suicide, and it was really hard. And I looked at my life as, as a sixth, seventh grader, I looked at my life and everything that I've gone through, and the two people that I just lost to suicide, and I thought, this good God that everybody talks about can't be real. He, everyone says how amazing, how good he is, they pray to him, they answer. When I was in middle school, I just didn't see it. I didn't see it in my life growing up, and I didn't see it then with the circumstances. So I decided I'd walk away from it all. I wouldn't believe in any God, I would just live my life and do what I want. So I did from, from sixth, seventh, eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, I did whatever I wanted. I went down a dark spiral. I did things I wasn't supposed to do. I, I drank, I treated women disrespectfully, I hung out with the wrong crowd of people, I went to parties. I just, whatever I wanted to do is what I did. And that, that's how life was gonna be. And it was, looking back at it now, not great. It, it was not fun, it was not healthy, it was not okay for me to do. And it caused a lot of pain and hurt in my life. Until I got to about my 10th grade summer, about to go into 11th grade, I was talking to a girl, and she went to this church. I don't know why she was talking to me. She had no business talking to a knucklehead like I was in high school, but she was. If girls, you teenagers, don't talk to boys that are knuckleheads, amen? Um, amen. <laughs> they don't always turn out like me, but, you know, we, it works out. Um, so I was talking to her. She invited me on a Wednesday night. I was like, you know, I got nothing better to do. Sure, I'll go. 
and pastor wasn't preaching. Pastor was away. I'm pretty sure doing a wedding. So Joseph was preaching. And I went and sat in the front row and worship began. And I, I'm not a believer sitting in the front row, worship again. I don't know what's happening. And it starts breaking down walls in my life that I feel I put between me and God. I don't, I don't understand how to explain the feeling. Back then, I, I get it more now, but I just felt something, right, coming through during worship. And so, so I'm just like, it had been a daze, and I sit down, and, I, and Joseph comes on stage, and he starts to preach. And he preached a message on sowing and reaping, that what you will sow, you will reap. And if you're sowing and nothing's reaping, then you're not sowing the right thing. Right? You, you should see a harvest in our lives. And it was about really, honestly, back then, investing in people also. And it touched my heart. And so after that service, I went up to Joseph, and I, I told him my whole life story, that I was mad at God. I was mad at the Bible. I was mad at people. Like, my life is terrible. And he, was, he listened to me, just some random guy who came and talked to him. Listen, he's like, all right, you come to Forge next Sunday night. And I was like, okay, I'll be there. And I, it started a, a journey for me and him that I started going to youth every Sunday, every Wednesday night. Also, back then, we used to have first week. We call it first week midweek now. It used to just be midweek every week. You had Crosby here every single Sunday. So I'd, I'd go to Joseph Church on Sunday morning. Forge Sunday night, Tuesday night be here at Crosby, Wednesday night be at Forge again, or be at New Canaan campus. And me and him just got really close together. I was baptized August 22nd of 2018. Super amazing, gave my life to Christ. That same year, Joseph gave me my first Bible. I still use that same Bible today, used it all through Bible college. Fell in love with the Word of God. I mean, I could not stop reading it. It's just, for me, at the start, it was just, I thought it was a really cool story. I mean, the, the, the stories in there are a lot of action, a lot of impact, a lot of really cool stuff. Fell in love with the Word. And I would always, when we ride up to Crosby, because New Canyon to Crosby, a bit of a drive, all right? can take a long time sometimes. The traffic's not great. Traffic wasn't as bad back then, but we'd ride. And I just asked Joseph questions. Uh, I read the Bible and things I was confused on. I was like, like, why does this Paul guy care so much about circumcision? It's super weird. I don't <laughs> really understand. He talks about it in like every one of his letters. He's like, ah, it's kind of weird, this whole thing with the Jews. And I was like, oh, okay. All these questions. Any question I had, I came and asked him, just, just love the word of God. Um, and then got to serve more in the youth, got to do the games, share my testimony with them, got really plugged in. Joseph actually wrote in my Bible that he gave to me in the front page, FYI, I see ministry in your future. And I was like, I didn't really get what that meant back then. I was like, I'm going to go to church. That makes sense. I, that's, that's ministry, right? I'm, I'm going to be there on Sunday morning. I'm not going to miss. But when I was a senior, things were going really good. I, I become a senior in high school. We're about to go to sta stable in the saddles the next day, getting ready for that. Got to go to bed, go learn about more about our church. And it's about 2 or 3 in the morning, my grandma runs in my room. And she, she wakes me up. She said, Josh, you got to go help your mom. I run out into our living room, look in the kitchen and my mom's overdosing on the ground. And I run up to her, and I put her on her side, and I hold her in my arms, and I start praying that she won't die. And I pray, and by the grace of God, she makes it through. The ambulance came, she, she ended up being okay. But I remember trying to go bed, back to bed that night, just mad again, just real mad at God. I understood now more that you're supposed to be good, God, but why did this just happen? And I had a choice right then as, as a senior in high school. I could have chose to walk away again, let my feelings, my emotions, my, my anger push me from God, put more walls up, or in a time of pain, in a time of hurt, I could lean into them. And right there, I got to make a choice, and I chose to lean in to God's goodness because he is good all the time. I went to stable on the saddle the next day. Me and Joseph talked about what happened that night. It was rough. It was hard sitting in here trying to be happy. But it made it, made it through. And then so that summer, I gave my life to ministry. I felt the Lord. I was like, I finally understood what Joseph wrote in my Bible, what full-time ministry is supposed to mean, not just going to church on Sunday morning. I, I go off to Bible college, and Bible college was truly amazing. Learned a lot. Graduated three and a half years. First person in my family to graduate from college. A lot of fun. And now, thank you. Thank you. I get to be back home with some amazing believers and, and help out at the church where I gave my life to Christ. Help out at the church where I was baptized, held the church where I have so many friends and family. And I look back at my story, and I can't help but notice that even when I didn't see it, God was good. When I, when I was 10 years old, I didn't know where my next meal was going to come. God was good. When I, I held my mom in my arms, God was good. Standing here right now, God is good. And he's going to continue to be good. Thank you, guys. Incredible story. I uh, appreciate him, love him. He, uh, he'll be serving with the camp and helping out with the youth, doing a few things. He'll be the grunt, low man on a totem pole at the camp, so it's nice. It's good, good to have him back. 
but this whole this whole story and then and then my place in his life it just reminded me of about investment and investing in others and how it's so important in our lives every every single one of us to pour into people uh let's let's break this down real quick intentional investment intentional means making daily decisions based on the vision we have for our lives or living on purpose with purpose you know doing things specifically in our lives to invest not just you know it's easy to give somebody some money a little bit well not always easy but slip some money and be done with it but to go a step further and, and do life with somebody and intentionally live in such a way that you make an impact on somebody's life an investment is the thing or in this case that we're going to talk about today uh the people that we place our focus and attention on. We're answering questions like, why am I here? What does God want me to accomplish in this life? Are the things, I, I, are the things that I'm doing in my life honoring God? Are the things I'm investing in building the kingdom of God? We have to start asking ourselves, reflecting on our lives and, and realize, what am I doing with this thing? What am I doing with the time that God has given me? Am I just going through the motions or am I actually making an eternal difference? Because eternally, we're going to spend much more time eternally with God or without God than we are in this world. And so we have to start looking at our lives and say, what am I doing to make a difference there? Because that's going to make more of an impact than if I were just to go through the motions today. And you know what? I believe God created us with, intent, with the intention that we would live intentionally. That we wouldn't just float and skate by, that we would actually uh, progress and have vision for our future and our lives and actually do something. And we need to make the most of the time we have here. Again, Pastor infamously says, he says this all the time, relationships is the currency of the kingdom. You've heard that, right? But it's so true, and I, and I want to really unpack this truth this morning. We will not take our success, our livelihood, or the American dream with us after this life is over. We will not take any of that with us. The only thing that we will take with us are the people that we invest in and the people who know Jesus. Those are the people that are going to make or are going to have an eternal difference in their life. Somebody said this. I don't know who said it. I just stole it. Said, uh, none of us are complete, but together we are whole. In his wisdom, God has not given any of us everything we need. Instead, he chose to gift us one another. You complete me. And I complete you, and we need one another. And I, I think I said this the last message I was here, because relationships are so important in our lives to, to really invest in. I want to turn to Matthew 25, 15 through 30. It's a lot of reading. It's a parable. And so just stay with me as I read this, okay? It says right here, uh, verse 15, to one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one who with two bags of gold gained two more, but the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid it, his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Ma uh, master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. Verse 23, the master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the master who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. And then his master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit in the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. And then he goes on to, pretty much call him out of, of what he lacked in his life. This message, I mean, this, this parable is so important to us because I know a lot of times we look at this and this is the money. He's talking about money, but in reality, he's talking about the things he places in our life and what we do with them. And whether that be money that he blesses us with, whether that may be our gifts and abilities that he's given to us, or whether that be people he's placed in our lives for us to invest in. 
The reality is that sometimes what we do, we take these things and we just use them selfishly. Rather than investing into them, investing into people, we take advantage of people or we just stay in our bubble and we ignore people because we're tired of dealing with it. Some of us have gotten there, right? So I'm tired of people. I'm tired of dealing with people. So you get home, you just walk away and say, yeah, that was mine. Uh, you walk away and say, I'm not going to deal with it. But there's several things here in this passage I really want us to grab a hold of this morning. The first one is that every person in this, this scenario, in this parable, every single person was given an opportunity. Every single person was given an opportunity. None of them were given nothing, right? And, and when I read that, there's two things that I grab a hold. First one, no one here is exempt from the opportunity God places on you, which means every person in this room, God has placed something, someone, or something, again, in your life f- to see what you're going to do with it. He's given every one of us opportunity. None of us are exempt based on what we're reading. And it may look different, as he said a while ago, but God gives everyone opportunity to be a part of building something that impacts eternity. Last week, Pastor talked about Judas, a great message. Judas had an opportunity to be part of something huge, the start of eternal or eternity changing forever. Right? Judas had an opportunity, but what did he do? He was that person with the one talent. Rather than investing in the kingdom, he held it for himself and did nothing. In fact, he grabbed more. Out of his selfishness, he missed the mark. The outcome is exactly what Jesus is informing us in this parable. And the second thing is God would not give them opportunity if he didn't see potential in their ability. God would not give you an opportunity, give you things in your life, if he didn't see something in you that could make an eternal difference. Right, So each one of us not only has an opportunity, but there's purpose behind that opportunity. Every one of us. Every one of us in this room. The point is that he did not create you or invest in you without the preconceived idea that you have the ability to make an eternal difference by investing in others. And you know what I mean by eternal difference? Like if we truly invest in people, walk beside people and invest in them spiritually, it does exactly that. It makes an eternal difference in this life. The second thing uh, internal or intentional investment does is that to make an eternal investment requires intentional relationships. Simply put, true, true investment in people requires you to welcome others not only into your church but into your life. We, we have, I'm going to say this without um, hurting anybody's feelings. We've gotten lazy in the church. We've gotten very lazy. We, even the, the simple idea of just inviting people to church and saying that's enough, that's, exactly, I mean, that's not exactly intentional investment. God says he wants us to walk alongside people. He wants us to go a step further. He wants us to do life with people and teach them God's word, right? Josh, I mean, when he came to me, I didn't have all the answers, but we opened the word together and walked through it. Right? Never once did I tell him at the beginning, listen, Josh, I'm a scholar. I know everything. No. Even with my master's, I'll sit in pastor's like, well, now I'm going to talk to you, but I still have so much to learn, so much to grow from. And when I invest in people, I want to get down to the level of together and walk together as we read this thing. But we have to learn to make that connection, that to build those relationships in our life. It takes effort on our part to be intentional about these relationships. Verse 16, the man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gave five bags more. He put the work in. He took a step. He could have been the one talent and just went in his backyard, dug a hole, put it there, and left it. No, he actually made the effort to make the investment. The the day our investment in him changed was this day. I think there's a picture. Yeah, it was a long time ago. Five years ago. Five years ago. Yeah, well, probably, no, I didn't have a lot of gray in my beard. No. Anyways, <laughs> we think, no, 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 go back, go back. We think this picture right here, I, I, this picture, yeah, let's stare at this for a minute, Josh. Um, <laughs> this day changed everything in our relationship, and it wasn't the baptism, which is the craziest thing. The baptism was the great, the, the fruit of our connection. But the greatest thing that changed in our lives was what happened after. So Skylar and I, after church, we took him home and we dropped him off and then we started driving and we pulled over to Exxon and we had a conversation. And I, I told Skylar, I just, I feel really bad that Josh, I mean, he's, 
he's coming in our life a little bit and like come to church he's investing he's hungry but he had nobody there at that baptism no family there to celebrate with him like it really broke our hearts and so we were sitting in Exxon talking about this and like we have to turn around and go get him and so I called him up and said what are you doing I think you were eating biscuits and gravy or something I don't remember uh, I said put it down let's go and I, we didn't we knew each other from church but it, we didn't have a strong relationship yet but that decision to turn around and go get him changed something in our lives that he became part of our family. It, was, it wasn't just a connection. It wasn't just a relationship. It, it went further. We built something off of that. After that, he became our family. Addie started calling him uh, Bubba Josh. And then, he, I mean, he's at our house eating our food all the time, uh, all this kind of stuff. But we welcomed in him into our home knowing that. This is that intentional relationship, intentional investment that I'm talking about. It's, it's a step further and say, hey, come to church. No, come into my life and let's walk through the scripture. Let's walk through this relationship together. That's what changed his life. It changed mine too, and I'll get to that in a second. That's what changes people. Not just simply showing up on Sunday morning saying that's a good word and leaving. No, investing in relationships. Relationships, again, are the currency of the kingdom. And Jesus did life with those that he invested in, the disciples. He didn't just like, teach them and like, go. No, for three years, he was together, united, connected. They, they slept in the same areas. They did life. They ate the same meals. They uh, ministered to the same people. They did life together. And it radically changed the future of this world because those 12 men after Jesus left went off to do the same thing and other people. And this is what God intended for us, to invest in people. Check out this next picture. This, this is really neat. These are the, the great, y'all know what these are, right? Great redwood, redwood, sorry, I said them. Beautiful trees, incredible trees. You can see a person right in the middle of them. I've yet to see this in person. This is one of my dreams because it's, there's just gorgeous, something about it. The more I read into the redwood trees, this is what I found out. They can reach up to 360 feet tall, which is pretty crazy. Just to give you perspective, the Statue of Liberty is 305 feet. These things can reach up to 360 feet. They can get up to 24 feet wide, and they can weigh up to 1.6 million pounds. But the craziest thing about these trees is their roots only go 6 to 10 feet below. 6 to 10, 10 feet below. So how in the world is this 1.6 million pound tree that's 300 and, what did I say, 360 feet tall, how is it staying and staying upright with that much? Apparently, what you see in this one, they grow real close together, and their roots intertwine with one another, making them, giving them their strength. The reality is that we were created to make a connection with people and intertwine our lives so that we give each other strength. If I have a relationship with you at a distance and I'm over here at a distance, then we're not really strengthening one another. We have to bring people in close and invest in them in such a way that our lives intertwine that we can give each other strength. When Tra Travis unloaded that information about it, I mean, we have to come together with, with his family and their family and Maggie and, and the people that are in our lives that things are going and not just say, hey, I'm praying for you, but do life with them saying I'm there for you and praying with you, not for you, right? Doing life together, making that connection. The next thing about intentional investment is intentional investment is meeting people where they're at and pulling them into a personal revelation. Meeting people where they're at. This is, this is something that we also do in the church sometimes. Not our church. I feel like we're really good about being grounded. But in churches I've served at is when we get to a place in our Christian walk, we have a tendency of looking down at other people and waiting for them to come to us rather than meeting them where they're at. Um, Justin, come here. Justin, I'm always going to use that. Oh, just stand right here and just face this way for a little while. Okay, no, no, up here, up here. People got to see you. You're, you're kind of short. Um, Thank, you. Thank you. I have a very good relationship with Justin, so I can say stuff like that, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the thing about meeting people where they're at is what, what I am famously known for in our youth ministry is, they say, pushing people out of their comfort zone. Like, I, I do that a lot, they say, comfort zone. But I don't like to see it as pushing people out of the comfort zone. Because when I see Jesus, I don't see him pushing people out of the comfort zone. What I see Jesus is doing is being in front of people, face me, and pulling them into a place. 
right? Because intentional relationships bring people into a personal revelation. I want him to see the potential he has in his life because he may not see it, but I see it. And, I, and because I've experienced it in my own life, and I want to pull him into that revelation. But the reality is sometimes we like to do this. We like to just push people, right? But look at this right here in Matthew 14. You know, I love you. Matthew 14, uh, in verse 25, we, we know this story. Shortly before dawn, Jesus, stay there. Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said, and then we know how this unfolds. Jesus, or Peter, walks out, steps on the water, and he's walking on water, right? But the thing about this story is that we might not see is Jesus didn't show up on the boat as Peter's looking at the water and just like looking at the water. Like, go ahead, bro. I dare you step out there. See what happens. Uh, you, you're going to walk on the water. Just go ahead. Uh, he's never seen it. You wouldn't do it. Be quiet. Uh, <laughs> He's never seen it. He's never seen it happen. But what gave him the confidence is Jesus on the water, right? He was there in that place already. And so he says, come on, Peter, go ahead. And he, yeah, willingly, you can sit down, thank you. Uh, he willingly did this <laughs> because Jesus was already in a place that was familiar to him and gave him the confidence. Later, he jumps off the boat with a jacket on thinking he's gonna walk on water again because of this moment. But it gave him this confidence. He pulled him into that confidence and that revelation. And then we know the story. He looks away, away from Jesus, and he sinks. But the reality is he pulls him into that place. We have to pull others into this place in our lives. We can't just push them, give them the word, and push them out and, and trust that they're going to be okay and, and be all right. No, we pull them into our lives and pull them into these places uh, more than a connection, more than just simply doing this. We pull them into this. Jesus changed the world because he not only lowered himself from heaven, but he lowered himself to meet and love people where they were at. But he didn't leave it there. Sometimes we think he left it there. No, he didn't leave it there. He took a step forward by pulling them into an unfamiliar place that showed them the potential that God planted in them. You see this in the disciples' lives. He pulled them in a place that was unfamiliar. They left their work. They left everything that was familiar to them. And they brought them into a life. And they witnessed Jesus doing all these things. And once Jesus left, of course, they went back. And Jesus come back. I'm like, oh, you're real. And all that kind of stuff. But once he left again, then they went into the world and started making a difference with confidence because Jesus had already pulled him into that place. He didn't just throw him in the world and say, you're going to see things you've never seen before. He's like, you've already witnessed this. Witness me do these things. Now you're going to be able to do this kind of stuff. He pulled them in. It might have been unfamiliar, but he pulled them in. He walked alongside of them. He prayed with them. He taught them. He did life with them. He didn't just show up on Sunday morning and that's it. He did life. He invested in people. When we, we went to Guatemala last year, I went with four other guys from our church. This year we're taking 11, very excited, and just like three months, or three, three weeks, three, four weeks. Anyways, there was this time on the, we were climbing this mountain to get to our work site on a bus, and then we got stuck in traffic. So we're, we're on a bus on the side of a mountain for like two, two and a half hours, or something like that. And I had already drunk a lot of water, and so I had to use the restroom. And I'm on, we're on the side of this mountain. There's trees on this side, trees on this side, and the bus is doing this and just parked there. And there's cars in front of us, cars behind us, and I'm in a different country. And I'm thinking, I'm going to have to get off this bus and go past those trees in front of all these Guatemalans that I don't know. I mean, there could be on somebody on the other side of that tree red, and it killed me. I don't know. Uh, I'm, I've never been here. Um, but I did. And then I grabbed Greg. Greg is my brother-in-law. He, he does the sound system at the other campus, and he also helps us with youth. Uh, I grabbed him and said, hey, come with me, you know, support system. Uh, so we walked. Yeah, no, I, I went straight woman status. Uh, I grabbed him. I was in a different country. Stop judging me. We, we started walking toward there. He stayed by the road, and then I went on the other side uh, of the trees and did my business. But when I got on the other side of these trees, I experienced something amazing. There was the most beautiful view I've ever seen. And then I yelled at Greg, Greg, you have to come see this. This is the, this is the view. He is not peeing here. I, I, I saw that. <laughs> it does look like he is not. He's just admiring the beauty. I didn't think about that when I put that picture up because it does look like that. 
But the view, the view, let's focus on the view. But I had already experienced this, and then I pulled Greg into that experience, right? He would never have seen this if I didn't pull him into that experience. There's things in your life that you've experienced with God that nobody will ever experience until you pull them into that place, until you have that ability to shift things around you and pull them into these incredible places that God has for them and for you. And so we have to be in that place. When we meet people where they're at and pull them into this place, we walk with them. We, when we push them, we push them into a place where they're alone and learning and how to deal with life. And it doesn't work. But this is not Jesus' intention. This is not how Jesus did it. He went, he experienced these things, and he pulled people into that place. That's what I, I strive to do in my life. The next thing is, is we can't ignore the reality that investing also means risk. There are risks. There are risks. Great rewards become great because we're truly invested, right? If we just throw something in and halfway do it, we're not truly invested. But when we're truly invested, then it also means opening yourself up to risk and, and pain and hurt. Participant trophies have no meaning when we don't invest. There are risks with investing people, investing people, sacrificing our own needs and our desires. But when we hold on to, or we, but when he told us to save our lives, we must lose it. In Matthew 16, 25, he says, you're going to have to sacrifice some things in your life if you want to gain. And we, committed, we have to be committed to gaining and, and even push through the risk. And I can't tell you how many times I've been lied to, looked over, or just walked away from by people that I've invested in. It's just a part of this crazy life. But it shouldn't stop us or slow us down. We should continue to push, push forward and press forward. Our lives are not our own in the first place. We are caretakers of the blessing of this life. The more we invest back in the kingdom, the more reward will be given to us. Matthew 25, 28 through 30 talks about missing the mark because they decided not to take the risk. Right? That's what he had against the person with one talent. He didn't take a risk. He didn't invest. He didn't do the things that God asked him to do. And of course, intentional investment has its rewards as well. Our reward is the currency of the kingdom, as pastor always talks about. And to, to be clear, we don't invest in others for the blessings. We, do it for the, we don't do it for the rewards. We do it because this is what our Father asks of us, and we love our Father. I mean, Matthew 28, he says, go make disciples of the nation, baptize them. He's telling us to do these things. He's commanding us to do these things. We do these things because we love him and because we love his people because he called us to do that, right? Sometimes we over-spiritualize or make it too religious, but intentional investing is waking, walking with people through life and the word of God to pursue a greater understanding and relationship with Jesus so that they can fulfill their purpose, it's like God gives us a key to the kingdom. And we can hold on to it like the one with the one talent and never do anything with it. And we're never going to take anybody to the eternity with us. Or we can do what he says and give people access to the key so they can get to the kingdom, so they can understand who Jesus is. And we walk beside them in this. The thing about our relationship is that what I didn't tell you about on my side of things is yes, I was opening up my life to him. Oh, he came into my life. He came into our, our family's life. He, my, my wife mothers him, right, uh, and feeds him, and uh, we do life together. We always have. When he's at college, he called me once a week, checking in. Just that's our relationship. But where I was when he met me was in a place in my ministry where I was about to give up. I don't like to talk about this, but I was like at a place in my life that I felt like, I'm not making a difference anymore. I don't know why I'm doing this. I don't know why I'm doing youth ministry anymore. I don't know why I'm at this church. Like I was getting ready to figure out the next step or the next part of my life outside of the church because I just didn't see it for me. I didn't see it in the lives. So I was pouring into teenagers doing this every week, but I just like I'm not making a difference. I'm like, Lord, what do you want from me? And then he came into my life and reminded me that we can still invest in people and it make a difference. He became hungry for the word. I'm like, wow, I've never seen a teenager so hungry for the word of God. And it gave me a joy and excitement. That's when we changed the name from SWAT to Forge. And it relaunched my heart and my focus and my ministry. 
And I started, instead of programming, I started investing in people because I saw investing in him made the biggest difference. It wasn't the events I threw or on these things I did or had big groups at these events and forge or whatever. No, is I personally invested in his life. And so I shifted the way I did things in ministry and started investing in people, invested in Jerome and Bethany and different people in my life. And now the leaders over here and started doing life with these people and just watched God do some amazing things because I decided to be intentional about my life now. And in, my, in the ministry he's entrusted in my life and not just settling, I press, press forward to invest in people. And then we have to get to that place and we have to walk through people. Uh, Marley, you can head up. I started a uh, men's group about a year and a half ago. This is the first time I've ever talked about this behind in church because this is a very personal thing. Uh, I started about a year and a half ago. It was with Jerome. It was when I first wanted to start investing in Jerome and his brother, uh, and I think one other guy, and we started this men's group. We didn't call it men's group. We just met once a week, and we just opened the word and got into it. And we've still been doing that for a year and a half. And, of course, I think there's like 12 guys that come now. But it's, it's nothing about promotion. It's not about being the biggest ministry. This is about walking side by side with people, right? And anybody can come. Pastor mentioned it the other day. And, and I, I have been adamant about not promoting it because I want it to be about the guys investing in other guys because that's what this is about. But that's the heart of it. We have to invest in others, after God showed me that I can make more of a distance by investing in people and then being actually behind the pulpit, it changed something in me. It wanted me, it's a much personal, you can make a much more significant difference as a whole investing in people than one person can be behind the pulpit. And actually, I could go through the numbers. That's what actually started this whole thing. And I don't want to confuse you in any way, but it's incredible the amount of difference that you can make by just investing in, let's say five people in three years. It's incredible, and, and those five people continue to do it. It's incredible the numbers that come out in 15 to 20 years. If you truly put your heart into what God's calling us to do, the amount of people you can make a difference with, it truly is. It's, it's, it's incredible. But that's what God has placed on our hearts to do. It's not, it's not by simply existing, but by inv investing. By not investing, we aren't progressing. And I've seen... Men and, men and women's lives change because they've been invested in. Raise your hand if somebody invested in you. Let's be honest here. So we have to reflect on our own life and say, okay, what am I doing? Who am I investing? That's the question you have to ask yourself this morning. Who has God placed in your life for you to truly invest in? And maybe you don't see anybody. Maybe you need to start praying that. Maybe you need to open up your heart and say, all right, Lord, let me be open to this opportunity because he might already put somebody in your life, but you have your blinders on because you're just in your world. But we need to be open to the people that God's placed in our life and then make it more than a connection, but make it a relationship that you truly walk beside people in this life and pray, for, pray with them, open the word of God with them and do life with them and not on the side and just hand them the word of God and trust that they're gonna work this thing out. God's calling us to something more. God is calling every one of us in here for something more. And whether you're 12 years old in this room or whether you're 70, 80 years old in this room, we all have a purpose right now. Not in your future. It's not over if you're older. Right now, currently, there's people in your life that need to be invested in. This is what God calls of us. So I just want you to pray about this morning. I want to I actually, I want to bow our heads. Go ahead and bow your heads. And I want you to individually, we're not going to have a, a, let's say, altar call or whatever. I just want you to pray just for a second by yourself and ask God to reveal that person or people in your life that he wants you to invest in. And then I'm going to pray over you. So just spend just a couple of minutes praying for those people. Father, I pray that you would reveal those people in our lives. What's at stake here, Father? Eternity is at stake. Eternity is at stake. Lord, push us, don't push us out of our comfort zones. Pull us out of our comfort zones. 
and to these places of personal revelation that we can see that we have the ability, we have the gifting to be able to truly invest in others. Lord, if we have breath in our lungs, then we have the ability to invest in others. Lord, give us the courage and the boldness to act, Lord, and not just settle. Help us make an eternal difference in this life. Lord, there's people in all of our lives, Lord, that just need somebody to invest in them, that just need somebody to show them the love and the light that you provide for us. There could be hundreds of people around us that are lost, but they just need someone to notice and love them. Give us the courage to be those people. Give us the boldness to do that, Lord. And we thank you that you invest in us every day. Thank you for not giving up on us. We're here because of that. And we celebrate you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you get God praise this morning? That's good. Hopefully, you guys could take, grab a hold of that. That's just something personally that God's placed in my life. And I think, well, as we read, this is what God calls us, all of us to be disciple makers, to invest in people. It's an incredible thing. Uh, I definitely would not be here if someone didn't invest in me, right? Uh, and I'm so grateful they did. So uh, just a few things. Uh, just be praying for our pastor. He's on, he's on his bike uh, with j on that trip. Just praying that they have incredible uh, morning at the church this morning, impactful. Uh, do it? Probably, yeah. All right, we're going to have our servant leaders go ahead and come forward. I encourage you to also make investments in the house. Uh, honor God with your giving. Uh, there's envelopes on the back of your chairs there. Um, so if you can grab one of those, uh, fill it out. We appreciate you guys doing that. Uh, being good stewards of what God's blessed you with is important in our lives, and it shows our hearts and our ability to invest. So as we give today, we believe in God for jobs and better jobs, more money, less hours, bills paid off. Wow, I messed that up. Check the mail, get surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, rollings received, favor, success. You think eight and a half years I could get that thing? It's an insecurity thing. Because if it's not right up there when I say that, and I get in my head, I'm like, I'm messing it, I'm messing it up, and then I mess it up. It's dumb. And I could quote that thing all, all week long. It's funny. All right, uh, Bethany is actually going to come up and share our announcements. I'll give it up for Bethany. Bethany.